Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, depending on your time zone. My name is, is Rafael Ribeiro. I am one of the coach trainers from AWA. I'm going to share my screen with you. So the first time I heard about Barbara was two years ago, more than two years ago, when I was becoming the trainer for the Agile Team Coach course. And in our section about neuroscience, where we share how knowing about the human brain and can be such an advantage to an agile coach, we mention her fantastic book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain. Fast forwarding two years and having her attend one of our meetups feels like completing a full circle moment. This woman is a fighter a dreamer and really an inspiration for me. And I know for sure that she will inspire you. So without further ado, Barbara, thanks for being here. And you have the virtual stage. <laughs> well, okay. Well, uh, thank you, Raphael. And uh, this is where you'll see that I have limitations to the neuroplasticity in my brain. <laughs> Uh, let me uh, find my, I've got two slideshows here. Well, let's just, okay. So I think, can people see my slides? Yes, definitely. Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, yeah. So thank you for that uh, introduction and thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about what I'm incredibly passionate about. I, you know, I, I have a love affair with the human brain. Um, I just think it's, it's this incredibly amazing organ that we can't really escape. We carry it with us everywhere we go. And to me, what's fascinating is how it drives behavior, like how it shapes who we are. Uh, it's incredible capacity for change. And I believe if we can delineate and understand the principles of neuroplasticity, we can apply these to benefit people worldwide. So my life and my work has really been an exploration of the, the territory of the human brain, how it makes us uniquely who we are, and how if we can understand this territory, I believe it can give us compassionate insight into our own functioning and into the functioning of others. So today I want to um, kind of take you on a little bit of a journey to share some of the learnings uh, that I have made along the way over the last, uh, actually I think it's 44 years now that I've, uh, since I've started this work. Um, so for me, the, our vision, hopefully I can go to the next slide, yes. Uh, the vision of Aerosmith is really to transform lives worldwide by improving cognitive capacities. And I often, you know, like to sort of dream and think about like, what would the world be like if everybody could reason causally, like reason logically, make, you know, have insight. Um, you know, if people could make better decisions, people be more compassionate. If learning went forward with ease and joy, you know, what would the world be like? A few years ago, I attended a, a series of presentations at the World Economic Forum in, uh, in Geneva. And you know, one of the things that the thinkers around the table were talking about is how do we prepare people for 20 years down the road, like the students that are in school now, because we don't know 20 years down the road what, what is going to be demanded, you know, what sort of jobs are going to be out there. And to me, the answer is, you know, we can't necessarily prepare people with content or you know, curriculum, but we can prepare them with a brain that's agile, I love that word, that's flexible, um, you know, that can make connections, can process information, uh, grasp concepts. And to me, that's the most powerful thing that we can do to um, basically prepare, you know, students today for an uncertain future. And certainly all of our experience over this last year and a bit with COVID, you know, we have stepped into an incredible world of uncertainty. And, you know, other than all the stressors and challenges with that, it also can be an opportunity to drive neuroplastic change. So, you know, to me, the vision of our organization is to um, bring this work and make it accessible 
within you know educational organizations, within universities, schools, colleges, learning centers. Uh, we're we're now adapting it again because of COVID to an online delivery, but really to transform lives worldwide. And to me, what's really exciting in our research, we found this can happen from age five to age 95. Like really, there's no limit uh, to neuroplasticity. Now there's individual variability as there is in everything. You know, I've seen students that are very similar working on, you know, similar cognitive exercises and some students, um, you know, move four times faster than others. And there, there, I'm sure factors, you know, genetically, neurochemically that differentiate those groups. Now they all make progress, but it, it you know, one of my dreams is to see if we can, um, understand you know what accelerates some of that neuroplastic change and i think you know this work initially started with people with learning difficulties myself included but it doesn't matter where you start sort of on a cognitive continuum we can move uh, functioning forward so whether you start with average functioning or you know a learning difficulty or even above average functioning it, it follows that we can all enhance our brain's capacity to learn and i don't know if people know norma Deutsch's work he wrote uh, a couple of books the first one the brain that changes itself that sort of put neuroplasticity out in the world um, and chapter two is on my work and norman lives here in toronto where i live and we're colleagues um, and he also wrote The Brain's Way of Healing, and I would encourage anybody that hasn't read those two books, they're really, really fascinating, looking at the benefits of neuroplasticity to a really broad application. And a couple of years ago, he said, the fact that Aerosmith trains the brain processors that make possible reasoning and rationality is arguably one of the most important positive developments one could imagine for our world, and it's complex problem. So that's my vision for the future, that, that we take this work out into the world to benefit everyone. And uh, this map shows sort of where we are in the world right now, because our, our goal is to train people around the world uh, to take the work into their organization. So whether it's I said schools, learning centers, um, you know, we work with people with acquired brain injury, so in rehab centers, um, you know, one of my dreams is to bring it into businesses, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, we're now, I think, in 94 um, organizations in, I think, 13 countries. We uh, just a week ago went into India, just in, in one large school, so uh, my vision is to be in every country in the world. We are not yet we're in madrid uh in spain uh but you know we we aren't and actually we're in switzerland as well but i would love to have uh, the work more available in europe um so what have i learned over these last 40 plus years i'm still in awe of the complexity of the human brain and hence you know it drives the complexity of the learning process and science has certainly taught us that our brain has a significant role in shaping who we are that uh, this organ has something on the order. Some researchers say it's got 100 billion neurons. Some researchers say it has 86 billion neurons. I figure, you know, what's 14 billion, you know, amongst friends, um, but it has a lot of neurons. So incredibly complex and several hundred trillion connections. And this organ filters our perceptions and our understanding of ourselves, of other people, of our world, and our relationship to that world. And to me, what's really fascinating is no two brains are exactly alike. So if you think of someone you know, and you note that there are physical differences between the two of you, like you know, different eye color, different stature, different shape of your ears, there are actually more differences between your two brains than all of those physical characteristic differences combined. So our brain really does make us uniquely who we are. It does shape who we are. And to me, what's so promising is this concept of neuroplasticity that yes, our brain shapes us, but if we can understand these principles, we can actually harness them to shape our brains. And I think probably everybody knows what neuroplasticity is just really the brain's ability to change. We know that you know, we can increase neurotransmitters. Uh, we can increase the dendrites, which are like the, you know, the branches on the neurons, which allow for more synaptic connections, increase glia cells, um, more blood flow. Uh, and to me, you know, 
over my career, when I first started, first there was no belief that there was neuroplasticity. Then there was a belief that there was neuroplasticity, but it was very limited. And now we know there's even neurogenesis, like that the brain can actually grow new neurons in the hippocampus, which is really critical for learning uh, and memory. And as I said, what's so promising is this can hear, uh, can happen over our lifespan. Like our brain, which makes sense, is fundamentally designed for lifelong learning for adaptation, for flexibility, for agility, to meet novel challenges. So, you know, as I'm getting older, it's very encouraging that, that you know, I can still drive structural and functional changes in my brain, um, you know, to continue to, uh, you know, make learning easier, more joyful. And I'm gonna talk about some of those principles that, you know, I, I sort of discerned a number of years ago that drive neuroplastic change and now research is in agreement that yes, those are the, the critical factors. Um, so just a little bit of an aside, I mean, I started my journey in the time of what I call the pre-neuroplastic paradigm or Norman Deutsch calls the dark ages of neuroplasticity because I started my schooling a lot of years ago in the late fifties. And at that point, the belief was your brain is fixed. Basically, if there's a problem with your brain, learn to live with it, live within your limitations because there's nothing that can be done. So I was identified in grade one with severe learning disabilities. And basically my teacher in grade one told my mother, uh, you know, not to expect much from me, uh, that all of my schooling would be a struggle and that I had a mental block. So I actually thought I had a piece of wood in my head that made learning difficult. I mean, later I learned, no, I didn't have a piece of wood in my head, but I had blockages or parts of my brain that weren't doing what they were designed um, to do. And I really feel like in grade one, I was given a life sentence saying, you know, <laughs> you know, that nothing much was going to be, you know, the result of anything that, that I did. Um, and so I set out on a quest all those years ago, and my father was a scientist and a, an inventor, and he had this belief. He said that if there's a problem in the world, and he said, if currently there's no solution to that problem, he said, it's your responsibility to find a solution. And then he said something that I've held near and dear to my heart. He said, if the rest of the world tells you you can't do this, do not listen. He said, um, don't be limited by conventional wisdom. He said, this is how science goes forward. So I was set on this quest having no idea, you know, how I was going to accomplish it, um, but committed to trying to find a solution to my difficulties. And out of that um, came this work and it, you know, came out of lines of research coming out of Russia, Alexander Luria, the brilliant Russian neuropsychologist that after World War II, with a lot of soldiers in Europe that had very localized head wounds, started to map function to the brain, and the man was brilliant. And then Rosenschweig's work out of Berkeley, looking at neuroplasticity with rats, you know, this concept of activity-dependent plasticity, that stimulation and activity drove functional and structural changes in the brain, which led to better learning. So I figured, okay, if I can understand the part of my brain that isn't working, uh, and if rats have neuroplasticity, surely humans must have neuroplasticity. And at this time, I went to all my professors because I was studying school psychology at the University of Toronto. And I said, wow, I know what my problem is. Part of my brain isn't working. And they said, you know, well, you couldn't be in graduate school and have a brain that wasn't working efficiently, which, because they didn't have a concept of being gifted and have a learning difficulty. And then they also said, and your brain is fixed, so what's the point? And learning difficulties have nothing to do with your brain, so what's the point? And I remembered my father's comment, don't be discouraged. So I went on to create three different programs, three different exercises for three different parts of my brain because I had multiple learning difficulties and saw the change. And to me proved there was human neuroplasticity. And I talk about that journey in my book, The, the Woman Who Changed Her Brain. And then when I saw the benefit, rather than saying, okay, this is great, you know, I can do things that I couldn't do before, I said, I want to take this out into the world to help people that are struggling. Um, and so now, you know, we are working with people with learning difficulties, um, people with acquired and traumatic brain injury, uh, people now we've got a project going on in Australia with uh, young adults with addiction problems because that there's a, a brain uh, network that's implicated in that. And also we're looking at people with the aging process, you know, just as there's cognitive decline as we age. So there's huge application. Basically, if you have a brain, there's application uh, for driving neuroplastic change. And we hear 
pretty much all the time that you know, anytime we do something, our brain changes. Anytime we learn something, our brain changes. And that's true, but that's not the type of changes that I'm talking about in the work that, that we do. Um, those are kind of temporary changes involving mainly, you know, short-term synaptic strength or temporary facilitation and inhibition in the brain. And, you know, this was when some research saying, yes, our, our brain changes all the time. But if you want to induce really significant lasting changes, they need to occur sort of gradually. And there are these principles, which I'll talk about active sustained engagement, effortful processing, and novelty and task complexity. They're, they're essential if you're going to really drive sustained um, neural change in the brain that's going to be meaningful and significant and, and show results. So. Um, so then just if we think about neuroplasticity, you know, often people think it's a positive concept. It's actually a neutral concept because your brain can change in negative directions or it can change in positive directions. And obviously we want to, you know, try to do everything we can to increase the positive factors and reduce the negative factors. And, um, and you know, with the negative factors, they can actually deprune. Instead of adding more dendrites, they can remove dendrites. So, you know, so that the brain is less efficient. And, you know, so anything that we can do. So the, the research is showing that um, there's significant relationship between, you know, mental health issues, chronic stress, prolonged anxiety, chronic pain, sleep deprivation, that in the short term impacts learning. We all know if we're really tired, we don't learn as well. Or if we're anxious, we don't learn as well. But what the research has shown us is that if these conditions are chronic and long-term, they, they actually um, lead to negative neuroplastic changes. And you know, one researcher talked about, you know, if you think about cortisol, which is one of the stress hormones, it's kind of like an acid bath for your brain. Um, it, it's, you know, it's not good for your, your endocrine system. It's not good for lots of things, but it, it actually has a significantly negative uh, impact. So to me, if there's anything you take away from what I say today, if you, know, you can figure out ways to reduce those negative factors, and I'll talk about the positive factors and how you can add those into not only your, your life, but also your, your work life or working with teams. Um, there was a, a study demonstrated that adults with a history of chronic stress and chronic pain is also in, in that category, had lost up to 25% of the volume of the hippocampus, which is critical for learning and memory. So really, really significant um, to reduce that. But the good news is at any point, we can reduce those negative effects of stress. Um, you know, we can do meditation, deep breathing. Uh, there's research to show that when people consciously practice gratitude, that there's actually an increase in the neurotransmitter norepinephrine and dopamine. And these lead to an enhancement of mood and an increase of alertness of focus and a decrease in stress. So even like, you know, as a team or as an individual, like five minutes a day, keep a gratitude journal. It, it seems kind of trite, but actually the research shows it can reduce these negative factors, you know, write what you're grateful for. And then, you know, there's a lot of research on meditation in the brain. Um, and, you know, again, you know, this was a study done 30 minutes a day over eight weeks, uh, just mindfulness uh, meditation, so not really complicated. And they found an increase in gray matter in the hippocampus, which is critical for learning and memory, uh, and increase in gray matter in structures that were important for compassion, for emotional regulation, introspection. Um, and then they looked at a group of people over aging, as we age, we lose cortical mass. You know, we lose something on the order of 10,000 brain cells a day. And that maybe sounds like a lot, but really we're born with something around a trillion. So 10,000 is, is not all that significant, but it adds up over time. So the bottom line is that about age 80, we've lost 4% of our cortical mass. But what they found in the study was meditators hadn't shown that loss, right? So again, you know, the idea with meditation is just a way to kind of, you know, focus the brain, reduce stress, reduce cortisol. So, you know, if, if one wants to add that into the one's practice, it has a significant neuroprotective effect on the brain. And then sleep. I mean, you know, this is something we 
can control. Um, and this is you know, some research showing you know, our brain activity while we're learning a task, while we're awake during the day, and then the brain activity while we're sleeping in our REM sleep. And you can see very similar patterns of activity in the brain. And you know, the research concludes that you know, part of what happens while we sleep is consolidation of the learnings that we've, we've uh, engaged in over the course of the day. And so it just points to how critical sleep is for learning, for um, retaining and processing memory. And you know, we tend to be a sleep deprived society and often be proud of you know, how little we sleep. Well, actually, you know, sleep is really, really critical and is also neuroprotective and reduces stress. So uh, encourage people to um, sleep. And then, you know, another thing that, you know, we all have in our, our control is exercise, right? And kind of the rule of thumb is if it's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. So it's really aerobic exercise. Um, you know, we know aerobic exercise that contributes to physical health, but also to mood, to brain health, to cognitive functioning. And it doesn't have to be a lot. You know, the research is, you know, 20 minutes a day, maybe four or five times a week. Um, really can lead to significant benefits in the brain. It pumps more oxygen and nutrients to the brain. It um, releases hormones that are actually nourishing to the brain and to the growth of brain cells. You know, people probably heard of BDNF, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor gets released, it gets stimulated when you're exercising. Uh, it promotes neuronal resistance to injury and repair. It's kind of like a repair kit for the brain. I mean, exercise is. Um, it reduces stress hormone production. It, it actually increases uh, neurogenesis. Um, so those neuronal growth in the hippocampus, which is critical, as I said before, for memory and learning. Um, so like the things that we have within our own control, like how to reduce stress, uh, exercise, getting good sleep, meditating, gratitude. We really need to engage in these exercise or these activities that are neuroprotective for our brain and for long-term um, cog cognitive health. So those are all things that pretty much all of us have in control and it can just be going for a walk. It doesn't necessarily have to be going to the gym. So then what are the conditions to drive uh, positive neuroplastic change? And these are pretty much what the, the research is showing and ag agrees on that active sustained engagement effortful processing and novelty or task complexity. And these principles can be applied to any activity that we do to transform it into uh, a workout for the brain. So, you know, and often if you're gonna do this outside of your work, you know, pick an activity that you actually enjoy because then you will probably sustain and engage with it. Um, so if we look at these three principles, like the first one, active sustained engagement, just means that you have to actively set your mind to the task. Like you have to turn your attention or focus and be fully engaged with the task because it's that targeted stimulation to that cognitive function, which is critically critical. So what you're actively attending to is what you're forcing the brain to attend to. And you need to do this for a period of sustained time. And again, the kind of rule of thumb, it's sort of similar to aerobic exercise, which kind of makes sense, is about, you know, in, in spurts of 20 minutes, it seems to be sufficient to um, get the brain into that state of driving neuroplastic change. Like if you, if you kind of think about training for sports, let's say you wanted to train for the Olympics, and every day you decide just to walk to the mailbox once a day, I guess they don't really have mailboxes much anymore, um, you would never achieve your goal because you're, you're not actively engaged in a sustained way. Um, and it's the same with the brain. It, the work out needs sustained focused attention. And then if you think about the, the next one, effort for processing, um, and if people are interested, a lot of this research that came out of uh, Rutgers University, Tracy Shores, I think S-H-O-R-S, her lab. And what she found was, you know, these brain, these neurons that were born in the hippocampus, for them to survive, they needed to be engaged in effort for processing. And all this means is if you're picking a task to drive neuroplastic change and you pick a task that's too easy or too hard, there's no effective effort involved. Okay. So if it's too easy, the brain is gonna just spin wheels, right? It's, it's, there's no effective stimulation. And if it's too hard, there's no engagement. No, no, no. It makes perfect sense. With the activity. 
So active engagement is unattainable if the task is beyond, is either too easy or beyond your mental reach. And the task or activity to meaningfully strain and provide a workout for the brain must just be on that kind of sweet spot, that edge of attainability. So it needs to be just like even physical exercise. I mean, if you went to the gym and decided, you know, for the first time you're going to try to lift 200 pounds, you wouldn't be very successful. If you tried to lift one pound, again, it wouldn't really um, drive change. So you need to calibrate whatever task you pick or activity, you need to calibrate the difficulty. So there's strain required to achieve mastery of the task, but not too much to make um, mastery impossible. So that's really, really a key concept um, to drive neuroplastic change. And then this idea of novelty and task complexity. So the task or activity selected should have both of these components, novelty and complexity. The novelty means that it's something that you cannot do on autopilot. Because as soon as you go on autopilot, which you know I like sometimes being on autopilot, it's not driving neuroplastic change. You're just kind of on cruise control. Um, so you need to find something that is not routine. And as soon as the task becomes routine, then you need to add complexity. You need to, to kind of ramp it up to make it a little more difficult to drive that effort for processing. So if a task that was initially novel and required effort becomes automatic, then add some complexity to increase the demand on the brain for processing. So if we, if we think about it in our life, like every time you step out of your comfort zone and keep yourself challenged and be curious, you're kind of moving to driving neuroplastic change. Like it's, it's as soon as you're in certainty and comfort and automaticity, which there's value to, I guarantee you that is not gonna drive neuroplastic change in your brain. So it's kind of finding that, that, that balance. And you know, people probably know Satya Nadella, who's the, the CEO of Microsoft. And he, when he came in, talked about, I wanna create a learn it all organization, not a know it all organization. And the hallmark of a learn it all organization is you're gonna um, be driving neuroplastic change because you're gonna be constantly engaged in the learning process. And one of the things this also does, which is really critical, and people probably know this concept of cognitive reserve. Um, and there's so much research out now that, that talks about the neuroprotective um, benefits of cognitive reserve. You know, looking at, uh, you know, as we age and let's say we're maybe I'm genetically predisposed to getting dementia, hopefully not, but maybe I am. And if I can build cognitive reserve in my brain, I may have you know, five good years, even while that neurodegenerative condition is, is occurring because I've got reserve. I've got you know, stronger neural networks and pathways in my brain to cope with whatever else is going on in terms of neurodegeneration. And if you put these conditions to drive neuroplastic change into your activities and your life and, and your personal life, your work environment, you will build cognitive reserve. So really, really, really important. Um, is so to start kind of thinking about how can you how can you incorporate these principles? And these are the principles that that need to get incorporated, along with those other factors that that reduce um, stress. So sort of in, in summary, oops, sorry, that's the wrong slide, uh, is, you know, over your lifespan, keep your brain actively engaged, really, as you're um, making cognitive gains, it's really important to start integrating them and using them um, in your everyday activities. And as I said, reducing those factors that lead to negative neuroplastic change, increasing the factors for positive neuroplastic change. And probably everybody's heard that Hebb's principle, neurons that fire together, wire together. And the more they fire together, the stronger the connection. So really, um, if I can stress anything, like just build those principles into, you know, to your daily uh, life. And then, so that's, that's one component. Then the other that I've learned in, in my work is that, you know, if we think about, again, going back to the complexity of the brain and how unique our brains are, each one of us has our own unique learning profile due to kind of our, our profile of strengths and weaknesses within our cognitive profile. I have yet in 43 years 
to meet any human being that has every one of these, you know, uh, cognitive areas all at the same level. Like, you know, we all know that there are things that we're, we excel at, that we're good at, and we all know that there's some things that maybe we're not as good at, and maybe we avoid. So some people get lost really easily because they don't have a good spatial sense. Uh, some people don't pick up languages really well because uh, the Broca's uh, speech pronunciation isn't working. There's some people that don't pick up subtle social cues because that's right prefrontal cortex. Um, so, you know, we all have our own unique profile that we bring to, um, to all of the activities that we do. Because anytime we do any activity out there in the world, we're calling on different parts of our brain to, uh, to work out that activity or engage in that activity. And just as an aside, you know, in the work that I predominantly do working with people with learning difficulties, a learning difficulty is what I call a cognitive load. It just means that a number of cognitive weaknesses or deficits pile up in that individual to make it hard for them to carry out certain kinds of tasks. So you know, if we think about our behavior and maybe we can avoid something, if there's a cognitive load, it becomes really hard uh, to engage in the learning process because there, there aren't the workarounds or compensations um, that they, they can use. And some examples, I mean, if we think about people that don't, you know, we say that person just doesn't have insight, right? They just don't make connections. Uh, they can't connect cause and effect, and they can't develop insight into their behavior, the behavior of others. We may attribute that, oh, that's emotional. Well, actually, no, it's part of the brain that isn't making those connections and relationships. And I had that difficulty. I grew up I had no idea why people did what they did and had no insight into behavior. Um, and then, you know, some people we meet, we say, oh my gosh, that person's really stubborn or they're really rigid. And that may be, again, due to a cognitive difficulty where they can't see or consider an alternative way of doing something. I had that problem. And let me tell you, if somebody asked me to look at something a different way, I felt like it was a physical attack. So this is where I talk about looking at behavior through a cognitive lens and how important it is not just to assume that somebody's behaving in a certain way because they're trying to be difficult. It could be you know, the makeup of their cognitive profile that they just understand the world very differently from the way that, that you do. And, you know, there's the person that you send out or you give instructions, you ask them to do three things and they come back and they've only done two. And you might think they're resisting or, you know, they're not really listening. It could be an auditory memory problem. I worked with a pilot that had this problem and he couldn't remember the instructions from the air traffic controller, which was a little worrisome. Um, and he had his compensations, like get the instructions repeated multiple times, but I felt like, you know, that wasn't really a fail safe. Uh, obviously we worked on that auditory memory and he now can remember the information, but you know, a lot of what we think of as human error might be, you know, just the result of that person's cognitive profile. And <clears throat> a couple of years ago, a researcher at the University of Toronto here where I live, uh, looked at the learning profiles of about 1500 individuals that had gone through my work. And he found that 70% of those individuals had a unique cognitive profile that they shared with no other individual. So again, just thinking and being curious about, you know, the people that you meet in your work or your personal life and getting curious about like, how do they see the world? Maybe what is the makeup of their cognitive profile um, rather than just kind of discounting them and, and saying, you know, they're, they're being difficult or obstreperous. So what are some of these um, cognitive profiles? And again, I look at a cognitive function as the job of a region of the brain or a network of regions, and they can work on a continuum. So somebody can be extremely gifted in a cognitive function, they can have an average functioning, or they can have mild, moderate, or severe level of difficulty. And across all these functions, so they can be gifted in some areas and have a very severe difficulty in other areas. Um, so if we think about you know, the capacity to read nonverbal cues, uh, this is really critical for navigating the social world. This is the person, if they have a difficulty here, and you've probably all met people like that, they're socially awkward. They can't learn from feedback in social situations. It's like they, they, they just don't grasp or understand, again, like why people behave the way they behave, and they can't figure out how to modify their behavior. They would be really terrible at negotiating. Um, because, you know, when you negotiate, you're reading 
the impact of what you're doing and saying on the other person to change your behavior, modify your behavior to move the negotiation in the direction you wanted. These individuals can't do that moment by moment reading of nonverbal cues. Uh, and then there's visual memory functions, and these are really critical for learning, um, you know, how to read, how to spell. This is the person that might spell the same word multiple ways on the page, right? You look at the writing and think, you know, they just don't have consistency because the part of the brain that holds visual symbol patterns uh, isn't strong enough to really hold those, those patterns well. Um, then there's executive functioning. This is the, the person that's constantly getting stuck. Um, like they just, you know, this person, we have an expression here, they can't think themselves out of a paper bag, you know, like they, they're, they're constantly getting into problems and they don't have the mental initiative or they can't apply the strategies to work how to get out of that situation or how to even avoid that situation so they don't get into the, the struggle. In my book, uh, when I, the chapter that I describe this, I call it hitting the wall because the person hits the wall and can't figure out, you know, how do I get around that wall, over that wall, under that wall? They just can't generate solutions. Um, to the capacity for recognizing faces, uh, this is, you know, the person that, you know, will walk by somebody that they know on the street because they, they just don't recognize that, that person's face. So often they'll get labeled as being rude. Um, because they're not saying hello to somebody they know. I worked with somebody that was a reporter here on the largest newspaper in Toronto. She had this problem and for 20 years, uh, twice a day, she went up and down an elevator to her office and she recognized every time she got on that elevator, she had no idea if she knew anybody on that elevator, even though she'd been doing this for 20 years. Uh, and she got um, criticized for being uh, a racist at one point. And she said to the person that accused her, she said, you don't understand. She said, all faces look the same to me. Like, I just don't recognize faces. Um, and had her sons had compensations. As soon as somebody came to the door, they would always use that person's name because she'd have no idea who that person was. So imagine living in that, that world. Uh, you, you might know somebody that, that has that difficulty. And a lot of times people, if they have these difficulties, they try to hide them. So <clears throat> because there's not really a lot of compassion or acceptance. And I believe if we can understand these, maybe we can have compassion understanding for some of the struggles that people live with. And then there's the ability to learn motor plans. This is critical for writing. So you might know somebody that they can tell you a beautiful story, incredibly articulate. You put a pen in their hand and almost nothing gets down on paper because it's the part of the brain that translates thought and ideation into uh, written content. And then auditory memory functions. This is uh, the person that has to scribble notes everywhere or puts post-it notes up all around the house to remember what they're supposed to do. Or the person that you send to the store and ask them to buy five items and they come home with three and have no idea that there were two other items. Or the person that doesn't like to listen to books on tape because they don't hold information through uh, an auditory uh, exposure. And then number sense and quantity. I worked with a psychiatrist that had this problem and she would double book clients, not that she thought it was a good idea to book two people in the same time, but she could not time schedule and she couldn't budget, right? So, you know, she was always running out of money because number meant nothing. 10, 100, 1,000 were all the same. This is a person who will constantly be running late and you probably know people like that or who runs out of money, who runs out of gas on the highway because they can't estimate how much gas they need in the car uh, to go a, dis a certain distance. Uh, it's critical for time signature and music. I worked with a, an opera singer uh, that had failed her musical theory three times and only had one more chance because she couldn't do time signature. And we worked on that and then she could do it. And then the capacity for grasping relationships, which is critical for comprehension. And this was the problem that I had. Um, and it really leads to a total lack of understanding of why things happen in your world. Like there, there's no why if, if uh, you have a difficulty here or a very limited why. And then, you know, spatial reasoning, 
which is critical for navigating. I had this difficulty and I had to add lost time. I always added an extra hour anytime I went anywhere to allow myself to get lost multiple times. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't read maps. If you know somebody, I mean, we don't really use maps anymore, but you know, that has to turn the map in the direction that they're going, that could be a spatial reasoning difficulty because they can't do that spatial rotation in their head. They wouldn't be able to build IKEA furniture. Um, like they can't go from two dimensional representation, representation into three dimensional. They struggle with um, organic chemistry because they can't build those molecules, right? So anything where there's a spatial uh, component, chess, checkers, um, would be a challenge for somebody with this difficulty. Your dentist, you want your dentist to have really good spatial reasoning. And in fact, they, they test dentists on this um, because they've got to go from the x-ray, which is two-dimensional representation, to map that on to drill the correct tooth in your, your mouth. Um, so that's, yeah, just ask your dentist how well they did on their spatial reasoning uh, ability. Um, and then this concept of cognitive mismatch. Um, you know, we hear this idea that we only use 10% of our brain. That's not true. Over the course of the day, I guarantee you, you use every aspect of your brain in terms of your, your activities and each part contributes to some aspect of your functioning. And if there's a piece that isn't working the way it was designed, it will have some impact. And I work with a lot of adults and develop this idea of a cognitive mismatch where the demand of the task that the person is engaged in in their career or their work isn't quite compatible with their cognitive profile strengths and weaknesses. So I gave that example of the pilot. Um, I worked with a butcher once who had what I call a kinesthetic perception problem. He didn't know where the left side of his body was in space. His brain didn't register it, it um, in terms of uh, sensory feedback. And so his job was, you know, hold a really sharp knife in your right hand to cut things and have no idea where your left hand was. So the first day I met him, his left hand was all wrapped up in bandages because he was cutting himself accidentally. And I thought maybe he should look at a different profession, but he really was, wanted to continue to be a butcher. So we addressed that problem and he no longer um, cuts himself. I worked with somebody on the Olympic ski jump team here in Canada several years ago, and he had a really mild problem here. So for anybody else in the world, it wouldn't be significant. But for him, when you're coming down those chutes at an incredible speed, it is significant. And he would tend to fall, um, you know, with more frequency than one would expect. Uh, you think about riding a motorcycle. You know, I worked with uh, someone that, that had a more significant problem here. And partly you control like the movement of the motorcycle with the movement of your body. And he would wipe out and have accidents. So I think I mentioned before this concept of human error. I think a lot of times it's a, a cognitive um, mismatch. And <clears throat> You know, I worked with a pathologist who was at a teaching hospital in the United States, and he was doing his residency and looking at um, a slide with breast tissue. So it was somebody that had had breast cancer. They'd gone through chemotherapy and radiation, and that was to determine, are they in remission? So he knew how important this was. He was being really, really careful, and he was just about to sign off that the person was in remission when his professor came to him and said, didn't you see these cells here? This is cancer. And it wasn't that he hadn't seen them his brain didn't recognize and register the significance and the meaning of what he was looking at. So he exited out of his program, worked on that cognitive function, and he won't um, make that mistake. And in my book, I have lots and lots of examples of, you know, what I call these, these cognitive um, mismatches. So, you know, if you think about some of your work teams, maybe there, there are people within your work team that, that, have a cognitive function that isn't quite at the level that it needs to be, um, you know, for for what you're you're trying to do, um, and certainly in our work, you don't know, because this is this is our area, we encourage um, all of our staff to, we have a questionnaire on our website that you can do and it's free. Uh, and based on your responses, it will give you your cognitive profile. Now it's not as good as actually doing the assessment, um, but it gives an indication based on your answers. Um, so we encourage everybody on our teams to go through that, that um, questionnaire and that profile. And then we kind of work in our teams as like a, you know, 
know, is kind of the joke is like amongst all of us, we have one really well-functioning brain. Um, and we recognize if somebody has a bit of a problem with the auditory memory, then we're not gonna put a demand on that. Either we'll, you know, I mean, the benefit is in my work, any one of my staff can work on these um, cognitive functions and strengthen them if they so desire. Uh, but if they don't or haven't, then we know what we need to do to allow that person to be an effective player in the team with that cognitive profile. So, um, and I just wanna go really quickly into some of what some of the research is uh, showing us with the, the individuals we're working with. So again, the predominant group that we're working with are students with learning difficulties. Um, we're doing imaging research at Southern Illinois University in the States and University of British Columbia here in Canada. And we're looking at, um, you know, I, when I started this work 43 years ago, I argued, you know, the work is fundamentally changing the brain, which is leading to uh, cognitive changes, which is leading to acquisition of skills and, and academic acquisition, and it's leading to social emotional um, well being. So, here are the networks that the research is showing <clears throat> are changing as students are going through, you know, our 10 month, you know, academic year program, but also our six to eight week cognitive intensive program. And these are really critical networks. So the default mode is, you know, kind of I'm, I'm thinking, it's the reflective. Dorsal attention is, you know, paying attention. Um, <clears throat> salience network, this is the one that's been implicated in addiction. Uh, this is like what's critical, what's relevant, what's essential, what do I need to pay attention to? And then the frontal parietal executive control network is, you know, how should I act? How should I behave? You know, it's executive functioning. Um, and all of these networks are changing as students are going through the program. And what we're seeing in the brains of students with learning difficulties compared to students without learning difficulties is that the uh, prior to intervention, there's a pattern of underconnectivity and hyperconnectivity in the brain. And the, the hypothesis is that the underconnected areas are these weaker cognitive functions that are, you know, not connected strongly enough, underperforming, causing the, the cognitive and learning difficulties. And then the brain in compensation hyperconnects other areas to try to compensate for the, the underconnected areas, but they can't. They, they actually aren't designed to do the job of that cognitive function. So what you get is a brain that's working really, really hard, but not efficiently. And if you think about the experience of a student with a learning difficulty in class, it's exactly that. They're working much harder than other students, but not efficiently and not getting their results. So to me, it's really fascinating. And we're seeing the same pattern in individuals with acquired brain injury and traumatic brain injury. We're seeing exactly the same pattern where the damage is, there's underconnectivity, and the brain hyperconnects in, in response. So what's happening as students go through this program and what are the changes we're seeing? We're seeing that <clears throat> those underconnected areas start to strengthen in connectivity and the hyperconnected areas start to relax. So the brain starts to normalize and process efficiently. And these, these networks are critical involved in attention, uh, working memory, thinking, planning, problem solving, making decisions, um, comprehension, the ability to take perspective of another. So this is critical for empathy. These networks are engaged in that. Self-awareness through the integration of sensory, emotional, and cognitive information, they're really critical for, especially the frontal parietal network, for using past experiences to plan for, for um, the future. Uh, mental initiative, efficiency of processing. And one student, I always love how students summarize all the research, like we have all this, this data, and then a student sums it up in like one sentence. Uh, so this student, he was, I think, 24 at the time. He said, I began to organize my thoughts more effectively, to plan ahead, first a few weeks ahead, then a few months ahead. Um, he said, for the first time in my life, I had real long-term goals and was able to take steps towards achieving them. This student, you know, his parents despaired. They said he's just drifting. He's going nowhere in his life. After doing this work, he went on to finish a four-year design course. And then he came second in the world designing a racing car. Um, and we didn't give him the spatial. We didn't give him all the gifts that he had in his right hemisphere. He had them. But we gave him the executive control to actually realize and utilize those gifts in the world. So more activation in all of these networks is beneficial to all aspects of learning. 
And then just really quickly, and if people are interested, all this research uh, is on our website. I'm a huge research geek. Um, so we're doing research with three different universities, uh, two in Canada, one in the United States. And these are cognitive domains because, you know, you change the brain, great, but does it lead to real world changes? So we're seeing things like processing speed, auditory processing, short term memory, long term memory, working memory, uh, verbal fluency, cognitive efficiency. All of these cognitive domains are changing uh, in these individuals while the brain is changing and at a very significant level. And then because we're dealing with students in academic programs, because we've, we've got a school here in, in Toronto, um, <clears throat> and these, these students, 75% of their day, they're doing cognitive exercises. They're only doing one period of math and one period of English. And parents often say, oh my gosh, my child is struggling academically and you're taking them out of academic classes. I argue we're actually changing their brain, which is what's gonna allow them to le learn the academics. And that's what they're seeing with only like with significantly less academics, these students are making uh, significant academic gains in terms of you know, spelling, math, uh, reasoning and mathematics, um, receptive language, vocabulary, comprehension, word recognition, because we're changing the brain's fundamental capacity to learn. Like our view is the learner is not a black box. None of us are fixed. You know, and most of education is how do we change the external? And maybe in your work environment to think of this, like it's not so much about changing the external. Yes, good lighting, good air, you know, um, breaks, those are all important, but we can actually change the internal. We can change the fundamental cognitive capacity of the learner to then go out and engage um, in the world. And that to me is, is the, the profound power of, of this kind of approach. And then because I'm interested in social emotional outcomes, uh, we have researchers looking at that. These students report um, more happiness, more well-being, uh, increased locus of control. They actually see themselves as agents of change in their lives. I don't know if people know Carol Dweck's work out of Stanford. She's the open closed mindset. These students develop an open mindset, incremental theory of mind. I argue you can't be in a neuroplastic program and think your mind is fixed because the, your, your whole experience is showing that you can actually change your brain. Uh, social skills improve, depression and anxiety, conduct disorders, all of that reduces. And in this one of these studies, they uh, measured uh, cortisol and saliva over the 10 month period. And these students showed a reduction in cortisol. So, you know, you change the brain, changes cognition, changes the whole reality of that individual to engage and learn in the world. Um, and if people are interested, uh, this is the organization in the west coast of Canada that's taking the work and using it with people with a traumatic brain injury, acquired brain injury. Uh, we're going into some really big hospitals in the, in the United States, Mount Sinai in New York, uh, Brigham Women's in uh, part of Harvard. Uh, so it's ABI Wellness, so Acquired Brain Injury Wellness, ABI Wellness. If you're interested, there's all sorts of research that we're doing applying the cognitive programs uh, for that. You know, one of the areas I'm really interested in, and I'm starting to talk to researchers, but haven't yet got somebody uh, convinced to do it, but I know I will, is, you know, the looking at the cognitive outcomes of um, certain percentage of people with COVID, right? We know it's impacting the brain um, that, that uh, I mean, in all sorts of different ways and maybe even epigenetically, like there, there's a lot of really fascinating research going on. And I believe some of the work that, that I've developed for a certain part of that population who have the, the cognitive um, problems after COVID could benefit with this work. And I'm really clear, this isn't the answer to everything that's going wrong with the brain, but it is a really uh, critical key piece that, that can, help individuals. So I encourage people to check that out. And so this is just, I like to summarize things. So <clears throat> what is this work? It's targeted cognitive programs using the, the critical principles that drive neuroplastic change, um, which leads to those structural and functional changes, which leads to increased cognitive capacity and the ability to learn, which then flows out to all aspects of, of being from better social emotional well-being, increased academic and career success, um, and, and that's fundamentally, you know, uh, what, what this work is that our underlying premise is you change the brain, you change cognitive capacity, you change learning outcomes, you change social emotional well being, and you fundamentally transform the future of the learner. And 
just if I can take a moment on my dream, this is my dream, that when this just becomes a normal part of curriculum, like we go to school to learn, we learn with our brain. To me, it just seems obvious that we should incorporate the brain into education. And it really isn't in my experience in most of education. Um, so I have a whole plan and actually we're talking to a school in Malaysia that may be in doing this and in New Zealand and we've done little forays actually in Madrid. Uh, we're doing this where all the students in a grade, so all the students in grade three, 30 minutes a day do the reasoning activity. Um, all the students in grade one do the motor planning activity. And I have a whole plan at each grade what's developmentally appropriate. And I think that removes the stigma of having a learning difficulty because every child can benefit from cognitive stimulation. And that's gonna prepare our students for whatever our uncertain uh, future. So they can be agile, they can be flexible, um, they can be lifelong learners. So. To me, this is this is my my vision. And one mother summed up, you know, what she saw the work as. She said, "Before my daughter used to have to borrow my brain to do anything. Now she has her own brain to to use to learn." Um, and just if there there's some resources, this this article has just got some interesting little tips. Uh, it was written a few years ago. It's on our website. It was a health magazine in the UK. So you know, if you're interested in getting a bit more information about some of the kind of tips that you can use in uh, changing your brain. Uh, it's a great little article. And as I said, it's just on our website. And then here are some books. Um, I don't know if people know Mike Mersnick's work. He was at UCSF, Softwired. I would highly recommend that. It's got lots of useful information on how to drive neuroplastic change. He was, he predated Norman Doidge in terms of, you know, the work he was doing in his lab demonstrating neuroplasticity in monkeys. Uh, Norman Doidge's book. Uh, there's a new book, David Eagleman. I think he's at Stanford. Really fascinating. He looks at, instead of calling, uh, you know, that our brain is neuroplastic, he says it's live wired, which is just another way to say the same thing. Um, and then the, these books, The Brain Pioneer and Brain School, the author Howard Eaton made them as free downloads. So they're on my website. The Brain Pioneer is a children's book on neuroscience and neuroplasticity. Brain School is, you know, sort of outcomes. And then there are lots of re the research documents on um, the website. If people are interested in where we are in the world, there's a participating sites. Uh, I am doing a virtual world tour every month. And I think next week it's at 7 a.m. our time here. Uh, so to try to reach, you know, different audiences around the world. So if you think anybody might be interested, I talk a lot about the, the research and a bit more about my journey um, in that. So we welcome people to, to join us. And if you have any questions, that's the, the email and somebody definitely will answer your questions. So <laughs> thank you uh, for listening to me. Um, yeah. So, and thank you, Raphael, for uh, inviting me to, to present. Wow. Well, what, what can I say? Uh, I knew I was going to be inspired again, even knowing your work and having the, the pleasure to, to chat with you recently, Barbara, but uh, mm -hmm. hearing from you live uh, and revisiting what you share in your book and your, in, in your TED Talks, it added even more connections to my brain. So I don't know if they are going to be long term, but I, I hope they are. And um, before we go to the, to the Q&A section, I just wanted to also make some connections because this is how I, my brain uh, likes to learn, is connecting with the other topics that, that, I'm, that, I, that I love about. And in this particular, for this audience, the team setting and the individual's organizational settings. So with the active engagement, as a software developer, I always had the struggle of, of being interrupted and people breaking my presence. So sometimes we, we try to talk with leaders about how for people who are doing the work, they need time to really get into the zone, achieve the flow that Nihai talks about a lot, to be actively engaged and be focused on things. So there is a neuroscience um, reason of why we want this because otherwise people are just being interrupted all the time and they are losing that focus uh, the um, the the oh sorry the the novelty uh, that you were talking about the agile world is a really advocate for change and adapting to change and you need to be agile uh, but sometimes 
in the team setting, the way we, we run the processes or the way we run our ceremonies as, as a team facilitator or a team coach may just be the same thing over and over again for months or on the other opposite, changing all the time. So I think there, is, there has to be a balance between how much novelty can you bring because as you said, depending on the cognitive profile, some people may feel even more stressed with so much novelty or people will feel boredom with no novelty at all. So thinking about how, how much novelty are we bringing to, to people? And then uh, the HEPS principle about connecting the neurons together. And if they are firing together, they are gonna be stronger together. It is a huge concept about the difference between cooperation and collaboration. You have a team and everyone is working by themselves on different things. Those neurons are not firing together. If they collaborate and if you, you as a team facilitator or a team coach are able to create a space where all these different neurons and let's think as, as people as, as the neurons, if they are solving a problem together and they are connecting their brains and their neurons to solve something together, then they're gonna fire together and they're gonna be stronger together. So I was having this image of people as neurons connecting or disconnecting. And to, to finalize the, the, th the, the mention about the lower connectivity or the uh, under connectivity and the hyper connectivity, thinking about our teams or our organizations when they show dysfunctions, things that are not effective, what areas of those neurons are under connective and what areas are hyper connective. So the behaviors that people show that may be Ottoman or not, may be a difference in the amount of connectivity. So that is, that is my summary, that is my link. Uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I, I would try to go them in order. Uh, we still have uh, roughly 20 minutes to, to, to chat. So let me go back in the scrolling. Let's see if the person is still here with us. So Maru at really soon, uh, really, really early in the beginning. What, what is cortical thinning and losing gray matter? I think you were talking about losing the gray matter. And what does this mean? Some people may not know the difference between the white and the gray matter. Yeah, so the, the gray matter is the neurons, is your, are your neurons, right? Whereas the white matter are like the, the, the axons, kind of like, you know, the highways. But so if you lose gray matter and, and neurons are critical for neurotransmission, right? Because it's, you know, the, the electrical signal fires out, you know, goes through, you know, the, the, the branches, jumps across that, you know, synaptic synapse, you know, and then triggers the, the you know, the, you know, other branches, right? For, for neurotransmission. So the, you know, if you have less gray matter, um, it just means there, there are less neurons, fewer neurons to be involved in that neurotransmission process. So, um, yeah, so if you can keep your neurons, that's, you know, that, that's, that's better, right? And the fact that they're seeing this in meditation and, and to me is pretty significant. And, and again, like, you know, it's, it's not thinking that, you know, we have to go become a Buddhist nun or a Buddhist monk, you know, and go to a monastery. You know, some of this is, you know, just even you could do a walking meditation. So you get your exercise while you walk and do breathing meditation. It's like, I think sometimes as humans, we make things more complicated in that sense than they need to be. So, um, you know, how, how do we do that? I mean, to me, if you're going for a walk for, you know, 20 minutes a day, uh, you know, and there's all this thing like forest bathing, like being in nature, depending on where you are and doing a walking meditation, You've kind of got like three things all at once that are, are good for your brain um, that, you know, is neuroprotective and keeps it healthier for a longer period of time. And to me, too, it's so encouraging that, um, you know, not there's, there's nothing that we know that's going to reverse a neurodegenerative condition, right? If, if we're predisposed to get that, I mean, certainly not now. We don't know. Maybe in 15 years, we will know. Um, you know, I know some of the major researchers that are looking into that, but if we can, you know, protect our brain, like, which is an incredible asset that we have um, to build up that cognitive reserve, you know, that, that 
you know, there's no drug that will give us an additional five years of good cognitive functioning if we're going to go down that, that route. And it is, it's just, these are lifestyle choices. These are things that aren't hard for us to, um, you know, just to, to add. And the research is so powerful. I mean, there's, they're now also looking at intermittent fasting. I didn't present that research, but th there's a lot of research coming out on, um, you know, on how we eat, not just what we eat, but how we eat, right? So I would just encourage all of us, you know, because we're going to live most of us for, you know, our longevity is longer than it was for our parents and to keep our brains as healthy and active and as engaged as we can over that period of time. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for, for answering, Barbara. Uh, there is another one uh, that probably links with this. Can one be addicted to neuroplastic change or having a constant desire or need to learn and not stay in one comfort zone? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's 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 a really good good question. I suppose we can be addicted to anything, right? If 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 it's our kind of personality. But I, I think you you pointed out about there is balance. I mean, balance. I mean, I've given up in my life. I just I don't think I'll ever achieve balance because it's not my basic nature, right? Like you know, I've been told either I have two speeds, flat out or flat dead, right? And <laughs> and so I've just kind of at a certain point I've just accepted that that that's that. But I think you know if you have self awareness and recognize what drives you, um, but there are times where it's just nice to be on cruise control, right? It's just nice to you know, kind of rest in, oh, wow, I've really mastered this. And, and I think I put in like, you know, reward and feedback is important, like in the performance. So you've mastered something, you've driven that change and, and just kind of rest for a while and then make a decision as to, you know, what you're going to engage with next. But to me, it's, it's around, it's really around awareness um, and what, you know, what works for you. And again, if we think about that, you know, our unique cognitive profile, like we often make the assumption that what works for me works for you. Well, it's not the case, right? Like it's, it's you know, it's really, to me, it's being deeply curious about and respectfully curious about all of the people that you're interacting and, and kind of what brings them alive, what, what makes them excited and and what unique gifts do they bring to the situation and what unique gifts do I bring and not feeling like we all have to bring the same gifts or you know, contribute in the same ways. Like to me, that's the, the, the beauty of the human existence is like, you know, none of us are really completely whole is in all of us coming together and collaborating and working um, that you know, we really develop that kind of that, that whole. Definitely. Yeah. Again, makes me think about teams and how we, we sometimes uh, may assume that um, or forget the uniqueness of the individuals that we, that we serve and we work with and having that awareness. Okay, next one. Healthy brain. Is it about IQ? And are there any other ways to measure the health and power of anyone's brain? Yeah, I, I, I really tried to um, divorce myself from the concept of IQ. And in fact, a, a number of years ago when I was starting out, because I was in school psychology, we did a lot of testing, right? And, you know, there's, there's the Wexler IQ tests, right? The WACE and the WISC and the whoopsie. And, and you know, because I don't like to let go of things, um, I knew it wasn't really serving my clients or what I was doing. And somebody broke into my office and the only thing they stole was the IQ test. And I thought, okay, this is the universe telling me. <laughs> and, and I actually went to my insurance company to find out, you know, was it covered? And actually it wasn't. So I'd have to pay a couple thousand dollars to buy it. So I thought, okay, this is a message from the universe. Because I think IQ is, is a really flawed concept. Um, you know, it, it really was designed many years ago to see who did well in school. I mean, that was its, its, its intention. So... I just think, you know, if you sit down and there's so many, there's a Stanford Binet, there's, you know, the WISC, there's, there are, all, there are all sorts of different, that's my background is, was school psychology was in assessment and tests and, but they make a lot of assumptions, like, you know, how fast can you process, you know, like, can you do this in like five seconds? 
And, you know, I think of all the people that I, I've met, like my father who had 30 patents. I mean, the man was brilliant. And he talked, he was a slow learner. Like that he described himself as a slow learner. Like he, he, he sat in problems, kind of, you know, that Rilke quote, like, you know, I, I sit myself into the question and eventually one day I'll live myself into the answer. Um, like we, it, to me, IQ is so limited and, and, um, and I just think I'd like to get rid of the concept totally. It's really looking at the cognitive profile, looking at this, the, the patterns, those unique cognitive patterns and with neuroplasticity, if there's some of these that are, are weak, that are interfering, like with me, like that hugely interfered, you know, with my life, I could change those, right? And, and then become able to engage in, and learn in, in the world. Like it is, it, again, that whole concept of IQ, it comes out of a fixed mindset. It comes out of a putting somebody in a box, um, you know, it, it yeah, I, I just, I, I really struggle. Uh, and we don't use it anymore in, certainly in, in my work. Definitely, totally resonate with that. Uh, in our course, we, we thought of a, an equation when we talk about coaching, which is performance equals potential minus interference. Mm. And what we are sometimes doing with teams is we are helping surface and give awareness of those interference and helping people themselves to figure it out how can we reduce and minimize those interference so that we can really reach our, our full potential. So it makes hits right me in the heart with that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another one. Uh, so yes, and beyond, beyond cognitive bias, which is the outcome in terms of behavior but if the actual cognitive process does not produce the thought in the first place, seems to be the reality. Uh, my brain cannot process this. I don't know if the person yeah. is here, if, you, if he or she wants to clear it out, ask it again, or maybe Barbara Brains pick it up. Um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what's being asked <laughs> there either. So I welcome someone to clarify. Yeah, I don't know if Tim is in the house. Oh, Hi, can anyone hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you, Tim. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. I was trying to ask, is the outcome of um, a person's behavior actually less emotional, as you indicated, and more to do with the actual thought process not occurring in the first place? Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's not about bad attitude. It's not about... Um, uh, it, it's more focused about, it's an inherent problem of them mm -hmm. actually processing that situation. Does that make any sense? That, that makes perfect sense. And I would say yes to that. Like, I mean, that's what, you know, I, that's one of the huge pieces in my work that I really want to try to get across is, you know, often we look at somebody's behavior and say, he's being difficult, he's being obstreperous, he's being rude or she, um, you know, they're, they're making my life miserable. And, and maybe some of those things are true, but what is driving that behavior? And so often it's, it's cognitive, it's not emotional. You know, it, it's the way they understand the world, the way they see the world, the way they process the world. And that's, you know, Norman Doidge who wrote The Brain That Changes Itself. He's a research psychiatrist here in Toronto. He got interested in my work because he was seeing clients on the psychiatric couch that he was listening to them very deeply. And he thought, this isn't emotional. Yes, there's, there's emotional overlay, but he said, what's driving this is not emotional. This is learning, this is cognitive. And so he and I started a dialogue and then he started referring some of those clients um, to me. And as cognitively they changed, their whole world changed and they were able to then benefit from the work he was doing. Because if, if you have the difficulty that I had, which is, so part of the brain is called an association area of association areas. Like, so it's, it's, it's almost, it's the part of the brain that attaches meaning to everything. So if you have a problem there, you know, Larry described it, you walk around in a constant state of uncertainty, never verifying meaning with no relationships. I liken it to living in amygdala hell. That was my world. I was terrified all the time. And you can't have insight, right? Because there's no cause and effect. So imagine, and I tried to go to therapy, you know, as an adult, and I got 
all sorts of really unpleasant diagnoses. Um, you know, schizoid affective disorder, which wasn't accurate. I had a severe learning disability, but they didn't look at it in that way. So, you know, significant cognitive. I mean, what, what you know, Norman and I saw as these individuals develop that cognitive ability for relationship and cause and effect, they could benefit from insight therapy. So they could address all the emotional overlay that had come out of the cognitive difficulty. But if they stayed in therapy without the cognitive piece, you know, they could have been accused of resistance, you know, suppression, you know, you're just not cooperating, you're not trying hard enough. And it isn't that. So it's like, let's start at least looking at behavior through a cognitive lens to say that could be a determinant as to what you're driving with the people that can't read nonverbal cues. Like, you know, the person that, you know, gets right in your face and doesn't understand social distance um, could be like, they're just not reading. They're not reading the, the cues. Like it, it's, to me, I have so much compassion for human beings, um, you know, and I think at least at the, the first stage, let's, explore and get curious and could it be you know could it be cognitive that, that's driving this and certainly for me i got labeled rigid in school and stubborn um you know but it i think i mentioned like it felt like an attack if you said to me oh maybe think about doing it this way over here which might have been a brilliant way of doing it but i'd have to let go of what i'd like worked so hard to grasp you know to integrate what the other person was saying and it actually felt like a physical attack, right? Uh, and it wasn't, but that's how it felt. So I just, you know, I think if we can look at behavior in this way, we can have so much more compassion, um, you know, for other people and for ourselves. Wow. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Tim, for yeah. rephrasing the question. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the chat, I think some, some subsequent questions are related to this so yes there is a cognitive kind of like uh we're not giving we were not given all the cards or we don't know how to read the deck and therefore we just play the card that we are able to play so so this cognitive improvement in in a sense could help us see the other cards or think about different combinations of the cards and then uh, make our next play if we were using a a card game analogy. Mm -hmm. So let me go to the next question because I think the previous ones are related with that. Oh, so one about the getting to action. Uh, we in the Agile community, Barbara, sometimes really, okay, so tell me what I should do, what I should do about it. So uh, the therapy, is it repeating tasks to strengthen those connections? So like what actually happens in, a, in, a, in an activity or in a program to improve certain areas? Yeah, so I, I can give an example, which I think is, is easier to grasp. So first of all, the first step is you need to identify what that cognitive function is, right? Like so, and that was where to me, Luria was brilliant, right? He really understood the brain and through his, you know, he was very clinical, right? He didn't do all sorts of research studies with, you know, 25 people, very clinical and digging into if there's damage here, you know, what function drops out, therefore, what is the, the function of that part of the brain? And <clears throat> so it's, it's going in and if you can understand the job of that part of the brain, then it's creating an activity that's going to work that part of the brain. I liken it a little bit. It's not completely correct, but like physiotherapy. So if you have, you know, this muscle over here, you're not going to be exercising this muscle over here. Like, you know, the, the physiotherapist is going to know like the ligaments and like all, what are the things that you need to do to build that, you know, that system or that group um, up to be functioning. So similarly, what, what is the job of that part of the brain <clears throat> and what is an activity that will work that without the supports or the compensations? Because you know, we know the brain likes to compensate, right? We know as humans, we like to compensate. So we have to, it's, that's why I call it differential targeted stimulation. Like, so it, it's differentiated to that function and it's targeted to that function without ideally support of other, other um, areas that, that might then divert the energy to what we're trying to work on. And I'm really clear that my work is only one window into the brain. Like, you know, I've talked to lots of people when I travel and they found other really creative ways to, to drive a neuroplastic change uh, 
in the brain. And Mike Mersnick, who wrote Softwired, he has Brain HQ, uh, which is an online program that you know comes out of some good neuroscience. Um, so once you've identified what you want to target, um, and you've created an activity, and then it's it's doing the the active sustained engagement. So the person needs to. Our rule of thumb is. You know, it's about 20, 25 minutes of sustained engagement each day on the activity, um, <clears throat> up to about four hours over the course of the week. And then it's, it's you know, you calibrate the level of difficulty for the effort for processing. So you don't start at, at too simple a level or too difficult a level. You, you um, figure out where's the person currently holding in that capacity. And then you start the level of difficulty just slightly above that. And then once they master it, it's like a step-by-step -step progression. Like, so, you know, they, they come up and then you make it more difficult. They come up, you make it more difficult. So those are the principles. Uh, so an example for students that struggle with that visual memory piece that I talked about. Like, so, because because we deal with a lot of students in school, we get students that are dyslexic, that, you know, that struggle with reading or spelling or writing. Uh, so I've developed a program and it's a computer-based program and it uses foreign symbols. I think we've got 44 different languages from Telugu, Burmese, Sinhalese, uh, Tamil. Um, and the reason we use foreign symbols is the novelty, novelty idea, because if we were using English, the students could put sound to it, they could put meaning to it. We're trying to stimulate the part of the brain that holds visual symbol patterns. And we started at a relatively simple, simple level, like we're not going to give them eight symbols to try to visually memorize at the outset or they'd run screaming out of the room. So we start at, you know, depending on where they are, maybe one or two symbols and with a very simple language set because there's a, I think it's, I don't know, it's a Tibetan language it's called Miao, um, but it's a very ancient language, very simple symbol set. And then Chinese is really complex. So we have a hierarchy of difficulty, which is the complexity and the number of symbols and a process that the students work through to visually memorize symbol patterns. So we're not trying to teach them Telugu or Sinhalese or Urdu at all. We're using those symbols to stimulate that part of the brain that holds visual symbol patterns. And by the time they get up to holding eight Chinese characters in their mind's eye, English actually looks pretty easy, right? Like, it, it, but again, it's not, we're not, like the thing that, um, I struggle with figuring out how to communicate and often don't think I do a good job is we're not teaching content. We're not teaching skills. We're not teaching reading at all or spelling. We're changing the brain's capacity to learn to read and to learn to spell through that exercise. Um, and, and to me, that's the power. Like you, you, you build the capacity and then that capacity um, is there, whether it's learning, you know, English, whether it's learning like almost any language to read, to spell, but also to memorize um, chemical equations, to memorize math formula. Like it, it memorize, it's the part of the brain that holds visual symbol patterns, you know, whatever they are. And so it's, that's what we're fundamentally talking about. So that just kind of gives an example. But I, I would say, you know, you start with what is the cognitive function you want to work? Um, you know, creating, I had no idea if these things would work. I just created hypotheses and experiments. Uh, so create a little experiment and calibrate the level of difficulty. Once the person's mastered, it becomes automatic, increase the level of difficulty. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Well, you, you used a lot of words that us in the team or the agile community pretty much uh, know by heart the whole hypothesis driven development the whole uh, learning like like a systemic approach like not at the behavior itself but what are the different pieces that are driving those behaviors and, and trying to isolate and identify what is the root cause of the challenge then there are two things that you mentioned was amazing was like in the overall agile community sometimes we see a strong push and teach of agile per se so like we are teaching content instead of focusing on the meta functions of what it takes to have an agile mindset or approach things with a growth mindset so we we are reaching uh, our end of our time so um not only uh, i am basled and dazzled by 
being here with you and, and hosting uh, you on our meetup at AWA. Uh, I, I told you, uh, your inspiration, even before I have met you and, and chat with you, uh, it also made me think about, as a team coach, those critical factors that you mentioned, those three, the active engagements, the novelty, and the sustained effort. Is, did I got the three, right? Uh, effort for processing, but yes. It's, effort, uh, it's... effort for processing, yeah. Um, I, I may also leave these questions to everyone here. Uh, how could those three factors unleash neuroplastic change in yourselves, in your teams, and in your organizations? Thinking of them as, as brains. So, so that is a final reflection that I'll leave to you. Uh, Barbara, it was a pleasure to have you. Um, we are out of official time. Uh, I'm going to stay here for a, a few more minutes if anyone wants to stay and say anything. But if not, thank you very much and see you on our next meetup. Thank you. It was really, it was really a delight. Like I stepped out of my comfort zone to do this presentation. I thought, why am I doing this, right? Not because it's, 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 but it was a joy. So thank you. And thank you for all the questions. I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, and thank you very much. We will be, we will be in, in touch. Okay. Definitely. And we will upload the recording of this meetup on our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, Barbara, some people asked about if you could share with us your presentation so that we can send to, I, I, to the people who did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Just share the presentation and the slides. I'm, I'm really, really happy. I mean, one of my goals is to build awareness for neuroplasticity and this work. And I don't know if you're comfortable sending me a link and I could certainly, I mean, I don't know if not, but okay. it, whatever. And, and, you know, I could share it on my social media, but it's up to you because I, I know okay. privacy okay. is potentially an issue. So. Um, uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Right. We know here in, in Europe, we have the uh, GDPR yes. uh, stuff <laughs> that we need to comply with, yeah. but we can sort out this, this details later on. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Anyone uh, would like to say something to Barbara, please uh, step out of mute and, and take this chance. Just wanted to tell Barbara that I'm very grateful that she did something that <laughs> she didn't want to do initially. You can see it has a lot of positive impact on several people. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much, Barbara. Absolutely brilliant presentation and so insightful. It's really shaken my world a bit. So in a very positive way. So thank you very much. And your honesty was deeply touching. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Bye. See you soon. Thank you. Talk to you soon, Barbara. Ciao, ciao, everyone.